Hi, everyone. We are so happy to have you with us for our wonderful program today that the ABA YLD is putting on thriving as a first generation lawyer from law student through the practice of law. My name is Larissa Magnon Mervin, and I'm an attorney with Legal Aid of North Carolina. I also serve on the ABA YLD DNI team where I assist with programming and serve as a YLD scholar. So many thanks go to our wonderful panelists today, as well as the YLD lead, uh, leadership who continues to support um, the idea of first generation lawyers and bringing this to the conversation of why it's important in the legal profession to, to discuss these topics. So I'm thrilled to introduce our panelists today. Um, first, we have Robin Hicks Gwynn. She is an attorney in Charlotte, North Carolina at Hicks Gwynn Law. Her service in the legal profession began during her years as a law student at North Carolina Central University, where she partnered with Legal Aid of North Carolina and Conservation Trust of North Carolina to host several estate planning workshops for minority farmers and marginalized communities in North Carolina. After graduating from law school, she served as a law clerk to the Honorable Sherry Beasley on the North Carolina Supreme Court. She went on to work as the trial court administrator for the 7th Prosecutorial District under senior resident judges Toby Fitch and Clinton Sumner, and her service to the community in the profession continued as she shifted to assist individuals and small business owners in private practice, where she enjoys counseling families and individuals in estate planning, estate administration, business succession planning, and real estate matters. She also advises businesses as general corporate counsel and advocates for victims in personal injury and workers' compensation cases. Along with all of this, she also remains active in her community, serving on numerous committees, and in her spare time, enjoys competing in triathlons, providing engaging presentations to churches and organizations on estate planning, and spending time with her lovely family. Next, we have Dylan Batar. He is also on the ABA uh, YLD DNI team. He is a clinical and corporate contracts analyst with the University of Pittsburgh Office of Sponsored Programs. Dylan received his Juris Doctor from the Charleston School of Law and graduated May of 2022. Dylan, um, as I mentioned, serves in the ABA YLD leadership as chair and liaison of the Sexual Orientation and Gender Ident Identity Commission, as well as a member of the DNI programming team where he helps with DEI initiatives and specifically LGBTQ plus advocacy and inclusion within the ABA. Thank you, Dylan, for being here. Next, we have Victoria Clark. Victoria most recently served as counsel at the House of Representatives Committee on Oversight and Reform Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Crisis. She has a background in litigation, criminal law, and voting rights. In addition to her love of practicing law, Victoria is active in the community. She is membership chair for the Young Patrons Board of Arena Stage at the Mead Center for American Theater and president of the Cornell Black Lawyer, Lawyers Alumni Network. She is also a New Leaders Council alumna and served on the board of the New Leaders Council of North Carolina. She also served on the board of the Northern Virginia Urban League Young Professionals Network, including a term as president from 2017 to 2019. Victoria earned her Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy Magna Cum Laude from North Carolina State University in 2011 and spent a semester at La Universidad de Cantabria in Spain. She earned her Juris Doctorate from Cornell Law School in 2014 and spent a, a semester at Estade Law School in Barcelona. Thank you, Victoria. Jonathan Bogues. Jonathan is a commercial real estate attorney in the Raleigh office of Michael Best and Friedrich. He represents clients in all aspects of commercial real estate, including leasing, acquisition, sale, development, and financing of a variety of real estate projects. Within the ABA, Jonathan was previously a real property fellow and currently serves as vice chair to the ground leasing committee for the ABA's real property trust and estate section. Additionally, Jonathan was selected as an ABA YLD scholar, a program limited to 16 young lawyers nationwide to increase the diversity and leadership positions in the ABA YLD. He's also served as chair to the Men of Color Project, an initiative created by the ABA YLD designed to empower men of color to become leaders in the legal profession, facilitate an intergenerational support system, and encourage opportunities for community service and civic engagement. He previously served as vice director to the ABA YLD's public service team and helped coordinate the YLD's Operation Second Chance Initiative. Currently, Jonathan is serving as director to the ABA YLD's civic engagement team. 
So if those bios haven't told you enough, these people are amazing, okay? So they're awesome, awesome attorneys. I'm so thrilled to have them here today um, to share about their experiences as a uh, first-generation lawyer. And this topic is incredibly important to me as a moderator, just because I'm also a first-generation lawyer, first in, the immediate, in my immediate family to go to law school or graduate school, and um, just incredibly thrilled to be here with such accomplished speakers. So thank you all. So the first question, and I should note really quick before we get started, we do have um, questions that people have already sent in, and those are the ones we're going to go over. But if you have any questions that you think of while they're answering or just ones that come up throughout the program, please feel free to put it in the Q&A, and we'll reserve some time afterward to answer those questions. So I'd like um, each speaker to briefly start by kind of introducing themselves and why this topic is important to you. So I'll start with Robin. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this topic is important to me because I believe if you don't have a network of people that you can rely on and bounce ideas off of, um, as a first generation attorney, at least I did, I felt really lost. Um, and it took me a while to build that network of people who I, I found to be a really good resource for me. Um, and so I think it's important to pay it forward. Um, I had some really good mentors, one being Chief Justice Sherry Beasley, um, Larissa also being a mentor of mine. Um, she and I grew up in the same hometown. And um, although she, I think she graduated law school a year ahead of me, um, we often talked about opportunities that would be available to each of us. And so I just think that this topic is important because it will allow you not only to be a better attorney, but also um, give back to your community in a way that maybe you didn't think of when you first started law school or thought that you wanted to be an attorney. Absolutely, thank you, Robin. Dylan? So I, um, I think that being a first generation lawyer, kind of like Robin said, it, you have to learn how to navigate a lot of the processes and the experiences of law school on your own. Um, and I think being able to share experiences and, you know, just advice on how to navigate these things make us all as a legal profession a lot better and stronger. Um, and I think this topic is extremely important to me because from my background, I don't think a lot of people in similar circumstances would have had the opportunity to attend law school or even attend undergraduate school. And I think that being able to show one another that as a legal community, we can share these experiences, help each other navigate them. Um, it'll uplift us all to be a better legal profession. So that's why it matters a lot to me. Awesome, thank you. Victoria? Hi, everyone. Um, being a first generation attorney, um, this topic is so important to me because growing up, I always knew I wanted to be a lawyer and it was such a, an, like an esteemed idea. Like it was just, everyone would say, you know, oh, Victoria is going to be a lawyer, but one, no one knew how to help me get there. Um, and then people kind of like in my family, just held it on such a pedestal, um, I found it could be stifling to who I was as a person. Um, and then I just didn't have any guidance on how to get where I wanted to be. Um, and so um, my goal just in life in general is to help other people like me who know they want to be lawyers, but have absolutely no idea what they're doing. Um, because there are, you know, uh, there's a lot about the profession that's different from other professions. Um, and if you don't know how to navigate it, you'll just, I, I think, be set back. And um, I wanna help people avoid um, those setbacks as much as possible. Absolutely agree. Thank you, Victoria. Jonathan? Hey, everybody. Uh, Larissa, uh, first and foremost, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, this, this topic is very important to me, uh, similar to the other panelists. Um, you know, matriculating through undergrad, going to law school, I feel like for me, and I'm sure same with the other panelists, the course material and your intelligence was not a problem or was never an issue. It's navigating, you know, the ins and outs, the things you don't always learn or, or not don't always, you probably do not learn in a book or you do not learn while sitting in class. Um, and that continued 
once graduating and passing the bar, um, and, and similar, to my, similar to other panelists, I didn't have anyone in my family to turn to, anyone to ask questions about anything. So probably for those first few years, I was just navigating kind of lost, just kind of figuring out as I go a little bit. Um, and, and it's just little things that you will not always learn in a book or a course or anything like that. So similar to Victoria, you know, I'm here to um, anyone come behind me, help spread that word as much as I can. So, yeah. Thank you. So with that, did any of you know about opportunities in the law, like when you were growing up or was it something you learned in your undergraduate career? Kind of how did that come about? We'll start, we'll go the same order and start again with Robin. So um, I didn't grow up, unlike Victoria, I didn't grow up wanting to be an attorney. I thought I was going to be a doctor. That's what my, my family pushed that. <laughs> um, but because of some unfortunate life circumstances, um, I started a nonprofit where I found myself advocating for people. Um, and they thought I was an attorney. Um, and I said, no, I, I just want to help my community. Um, and so I didn't find out about ways that I could advocate for people um until after undergrad that's when I started the nonprofit, and from there I just kind of figured that I wanted to help marginalized communities um and I sought out opportunities to figure out how to do that but I did not know about those opportunities in high school or in undergrad it's always interesting to me because you know as we talk about like how we can make this more accessible to people who are in high school and middle school and teach you know, about opportunities, it's always interesting to hear about perspectives like yours. Dylan? I also um, thought I was going to become a doctor when I was a child. Um, and then in undergrad, just the classes did not work out for me. Um, so I switched my undergraduate degree to political science. So that's kind of how I got introduced to the law, um, case law, and how it affects um, the political systems and just conversations and debates in class is what really intrigued me. And I was like, wow, I really like to argue. I like to advocate for people. Um, and one of my um, academic advisors actually was like, hey, you should really consider going to law school. And then once I actually got into law school and I started getting assimilated to the lifestyle and what it takes to be a law student, um, that's when I really took charge with becoming an advocate. Um, and getting involved on campus and that's where it kind of brought me today to wanting to be an advocate as well for um, marginalized communities and communities that aren't necessarily present or represented properly in both law school the law and the legal profession all right victoria um so no i did not know anything about any opportunity um, um, for law students, you know, even knew I wanted to go to law school, I didn't know I was, I, I didn't know that I should probably choose an undergrad that had a law school on campus. Um, I, I, I would have done that if I had known. Um, when I was in, let's see, I started law school in 2011. I graduated in, um, in 2010, when I was, uh, taking the LSAT and applying to law schools, um, the, a uh, pre-law office on my campus was cut. Um, and so I was really on my own. Um, so really I knew nothing about anything. I didn't even know a lawyer. I didn't meet a, a, like a real life lawyer until my last semester of college when I went to a panel about um, the legal profession. So, so no, I knew nothing about any opportunities and um, I'm still learning about opportunities. Absolutely. It's like constant growth and learning for sure. Um, Jonathan? Yeah, um, constant growth is definitely accurate. Um, I did not know I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, it was probably my senior year of college. Um, I had a family friend suggest, you know, going to law school because, um, you know, the law is so diverse and it touches every aspect of our lives. And I still think that's true today. But growing up, I didn't really know and think about it. Um, like, yeah, it, it, you know, opportunities, different law schools, different, it, anything to help best prepare you for law school. I had no idea. I was going into it blind. Um, I knew a few attorneys 
when I was a kid, you know, at church or neighborhood. Um, but I didn't really know what their job entailed. I didn't really know what law school entailed. I didn't know anything of that. So yeah, I, I was going into it blind. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, it's interesting to hear everybody's experience that like none of us, it seems like really knew about these opportunities. So once you all made a decision that, okay, you learned about it, this is going to be your path. Did you seek out a mentor? Did like, I know Dylan mentioned that like an academic advisor kind of encouraged him. That was the same thing that happened to me. I was an undergrad and an academic advisor was like, hey, you should consider this, you know? Um, so what were your experiences? Um, did, did you seek out anybody? Did they seek you out? Um, and how did that work, Robin? So at the time that I decided I wanted to go to law school, everyone discouraged me from doing it. <laughs> um, so I had to pray about it and really decide if, is this what you want to do? Um, because I feel, obviously I wasn't going to have much support <laughs> from the people around me. Um, but at the time, my, my mom was dating a gentleman who was an attorney. And so I invited him out to lunch and we talked about it. And he was really candid about the hard work it would take. Um, I was used to good grades coming easy, um, just excelling. And with law school, I found everything to be very hard, um, especially because I had classmates who um, were second and third and fourth generation attorneys. And so they definitely, or at least I felt like they had an advantage that I didn't have. Um, and so after, having that lunch with my mom's boyfriend at the time. I also sought out other church members who I knew were attorneys. Um, and I had an uncle who was an attorney, but we never talked about his profession. Um, I knew what he did to a certain extent, um, but going into it, just like most people, I thought being an attorney was like law and order, right? You go in, the court session lasts for five minutes and the show is over. Um, and so I, I tried to seek advice from people who practice different types of law because I wasn't sure how I wanted to be an advocate. Um, and I just so happened to have a judge, a retired judge and a, a sitting judge who went to my church. And after church, I pulled them aside and asked them, what was your experience? Like going to law school, um, I've, I've, I wanna be an advocate. Do you think this is the best way that I can advocate for these people? So I think, um, if you don't know someone personally, um, think about where you are in the community and how you can connect yourself with someone who has that experience. Thank you for sharing. Um, Dylan? So I actually didn't really have any formal mentors until I was enrolled in law school, um, probably around my second year. So although I had my academic advisor in undergrad, um, bring up the recommendation of, hey, you know, with your degree, you should consider law school. Um, I was grateful enough to have my partner who was a year ahead of me actually enroll as a first year law student um, and being able to share experiences with him and discuss how, you know, difficult law school is, how the change of your intellectual ability and your learning capabilities changed from undergrad to law school was something that both empowered me, but also really discouraged me from uh, considering law school. Um, and once I was actually enrolled in law school, I reached out to all of the um, faculty and professors that I had that I knew I could relate to. And um, they were really a huge rock for me to navigate myself as a law student, um, access resources that I wouldn't have had access to otherwise. And um, learn what path I needed to pave for myself to become a better advocate. Thank you, Victoria. So I definitely had no mentors, nor did I know I even needed one at all. Um, you know, the people in my family that I had been around, you know, they had careers that they were satisfied with, but um, none of them had ever talked about having a mentor. Um, they really just had, you know, careers where it had like standard steps. Um, like my dad was in the army, my mom was a teacher. So um, I think they had like a more straightforward process. Um, and so I didn't know that like mentoring was a thing. 
um, even for lawyers. And I did seek out help from the pre-law services on campus. Um, but first, um, I remember uh, having a meeting with the pre-law advisor and she told me, I, you know, I gave her my list of, of, of schools that I was applying to and she told me to stop aiming so high so one I just wasn't going to go back to her anyway and then her whole office got cut so there was really nothing else so really um the advice I got and the sources of information were online you know there was um like law school forums law school admission forums and websites about law schools and those were really um all I had at the time you know, hearing that burns me up because <laughs> because it's just so many people have experiences like that. And like even applying to undergrad, I didn't even know certain institutions existed that I should be applying there. Right. Because nobody thought that they should tell me nobody in, in our school. Right. They were more focused on other students. So it's just hearing stuff like that. It's just so unfortunate, but it's so good that, you know, you can use that experience. And then, like you said, pay it forward and hopefully make a difference for people going forward. Jonathan? Yeah, um, so actually it's kind of kind of kind of funny. I went to uh, the same undergraduate institution as Victoria and my situation was not um, much different with our law school, our, our law, pre-law, whatever it was called. I don't know. Um, they didn't tell me to not aim so high, but it was just more, I, I, they kind of like shunned me off and kind of like, yeah, yeah, let us know, we'll schedule a time, we'll talk, and like nothing ever came of it. Um, and then um, me and Robin were law school classmates, so Robin, I definitely remember sitting there feeling like some of our classmates like were way ahead of us. I remember thinking to myself like, did I read the right thing? Like, like, like where are y'all, <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah, no, so so the main question, I did not have any formal mentorship um, prior to law school or in law school. I do now, and you know, we can talk about that later, but going into law school, you know, I reached out to some people who I knew were attorneys and, you know, maybe talked on the phone a little bit or may have had lunch, um, but that was pretty much the extent of it. Um, for our attendees to the extent that you can get a, a formal mentor, uh, mentorship, I would 1000% take advantage of that. Um, because yeah, like I said earlier, you can learn things that you will not learn in the classroom. So, yeah. Thank you. So we actually have a question from the audience, which actually was gonna tie into my next question. So it works out perfectly. She says, hello, I'm a 2L and I hate law school. I wish I'd never started, but it's too late to quit now. I don't know any lawyers I can talk to about my fears, hating the work, not finding a job, et cetera. What advice would you share for dealing with that? And that kind of goes into my next question, which is like law school expectations versus reality. How did you guys um, address those? And you know, whoever wants to address this one, feel free to unmute it. I'd be happy to start. Um, one of the things I learned when I got into law school is that there are several attorneys who never practice. And so you don't have to be a litigator or actually practice law, but um, going to law school can also open up opportunities in business that other people don't have without having to get an MBA. I also had classmates who did the dual degree J JD MBA. Um, they are now doing amazing things at, you know, Fortune 50 corporations. Um, but your law degree will open up doors for you that you could never imagine, or even in government. The mentor that I mentioned um, was second in command to the governor. He never practiced law a day in his life. Um, and so if you, I'm not sure exactly where you're located, but I'm happy to share my contact information and to help you kind of navigate your way through that. Um, and it looks like you have at least five people who would be willing to talk to you about just um, addressing your fears. I don't know any, I, I would call you a baby attorney who didn't have fears about um, passing the bar, <laughs> getting a job after um, law school, no matter what law school you went to. Um, and so you are similarly situated to probably every other 2L in law school right now. Um, yeah, I just want to add on to that and say, like, one, do not worry. Like, 
there's law school and then there's practicing law, being an attorney. Like the rest of your life, whatever you do with your career, it is not like law school. So law school is not, law school is kind of a generic experience but you get to shape the rest of your life. So even if you don't like law school, don't worry. It has no bearing on what your career is gonna look like. Um, so hold on. Um, I used to, I remember I didn't really love law school. I used to tell myself, you know what? The only thing I can do to pay these loans back is be a lawyer. So I'm just gonna keep on going. <laughs> um, and you know, I was half joking. Um, but I also remember like, um, you might not pass the bar the first time. It's okay. It's gonna, it's gonna always be there for you to take. Um, it you might not get a job right right when you graduate. I didn't have a job right when I graduated. Um, but you know, eight, nine years later, my career is doing great. You know, you might like whatever setback you have, it's okay, it's gonna work out. Um, because this the skills you're gaining now. Um, and the skills you're going to gain the first few years, um, they're going to set you up for life. And so um, it, it, whatever challenges you face, like it's, it'll be OK, I promise. Like there will be a tomorrow um, and everything will work out. You will get a job. You will pass the bar if that's what you want to do. Um, and whatever resources you need to make that happen, they are there for you, including us. And I'm going to piggyback off that as well, if you don't mind. Um, I, too, in my second year of law school, it was during COVID, I was online. So the access to a lot of my resources were cut off. Um, the access to opportunities for internships and mentorships were cut off. I also hated law school. I think everybody who attends law school hates it. I don't know a singular person that's like, wow, law school was the greatest experience of my life. I would do it 10 times again if I could. Um, but I too, in my 3L year, realized that I necessarily didn't want to practice the law. Um, I didn't want to be in a court. I didn't want to um, necessarily be a attorney having and taking on clients. Um, but I will say just push through. It is hard. It's grueling work just to get through and get your degree. But just like Robin mentioned earlier, there are a lot of opportunities that open up for you with just having your law degree. Um, so if you're already succeeding and making it through now, don't give up. It seems really hard and difficult to do so, but there are going to be numerous opportunities for you outside of just being an attorney, whether it's policy and advocacy, whether it's legislative advocacy, or you want to go into, I never thought I was going to touch a contract today in my life, but I do and handle clinical and corporate contracts and I don't have to be an attorney. I don't have to have a license. Um, so if you find your support system, whether it's your family or fellow law students, or it's professors who, you know, they've been through this already. They've done it 30, 20, 10 years ago. Just find that support system for yourself to make it through because we all feel the exact same. Um, and just know you can make it through and it will be worth it in the end, I promise. Yeah, um, and then I'll just chime in, you know, agreeing with my uh, fellow panelists here. I, um, I don't wanna say I hated law school, but I was not overly happy. So <laughs> there's a recurring theme there. Um, but the main reason I went and, and what the other parents have said, and, and the main reason I went to law school was the law is so diverse. It, you, it touches every aspect of our life. Um, you know, I've, I've met aerospace engineers who become lawyers and work in, you know, a field, a similar field, uh, policy advocates, um, I mean, you name it, business, like what, like whatever. The law touches everything. So, literally, like everyone said, you know, push through. Um, you're about halfway finished now. I think you said you're too well, um, and, and you know, and, and make the most of it, right? Because let, let's say you graduate. I think Victoria may have said it. I think Robert may have said it as well. You graduate. Maybe you don't pass the bar the first time. That's fine. You know, maybe you go on. 50 million interviews and before you finally get that first job that's fine you don't have to stay in that job forever it's what you make it so yeah yeah definitely agree I was one of those people with the 50 million applications <laughs> and interviews it's like can somebody hire me and now I love what I do right and I've been doing it for a while so yeah it, it, definitely stick with it um Jonathan you mentioned how you know having a degree 
in law is just really diverse. Somebody in the audience wants to know if it's helpful to add an MBA to that or any sort of master's program, or do you think law, you know, having a JD is sufficient? Um, for me, I think having a JD is sufficient, but additional degrees never hurts, but it just depends on what you're trying to do. Um, also, you know, an another consideration, um, and I'm just gonna be real, um, student loan, student debt, some of, you know, consider that before taking on a, 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 an additional degree. Um, I work with people who have both and they're doing fine. And, you know, I, I guess what I'm trying to say, I feel like I'm rambling a little bit. I guess to say it doesn't hurt, but it's not necessary. I sit across from the table every day with people, JD, MBAs. I just have a JD law degree or in the law license. I'm doing just fine. You know, I work on business transactions, corporate transactions. Um, so I guess it doesn't hurt, but it's also not a barrier. I guess it's not like a gatekeeper, if that makes sense. So, yeah. Does anybody else want to address that question? I agree. I just say I'm one of those people who do not like law school. So I don't know why you would want it two degrees unless you just had to. But, <laughs> but certainly, if it's specific to what you're doing, go, you know, like you said, it can't hurt. I'm sorry, Victoria, go ahead. Oh, yeah, no worries. Um, so, uh, so like my school had a JD MBA as well as um, do many schools and where you could do like MBA classes your first summer um, and then mix them in with your law school um, classes and overlap and get the two degrees. So if you want to do something like that, sure, go ahead. But make sure it fits. You know, if you want to be, you know, a criminal defense attorney, don't go get an MBA unless somebody's paying for it for you, you know. Um, and, and then also, even if you do want to be a corporate attorney, say you want to do um, kind of like venture capital or something like that, you don't have to get that exact degree because you can, if you're, um, the university where your law school is has um, a business school as well, you can see if you can take classes there to be credited towards your JD um, without actually enrolling as a business student um, to but I mean, throw that out the window if somebody else paid for it. If somebody else paid for it, go get that degree. Um, but just uh, recognize that like law school have some business related courses and you can go to the business school and have them put on your, uh, contribute to your degree. Thank you, definitely helpful tips. Dylan? I was just gonna say, um, I also think a JD is a uh, sufficient, um, but one thing they don't teach you in law school is how to market your degree. Um, right? When you go into law school, you get a JD, you think you're always going to come out and be an attorney. Um, try to learn ways to transfer your education and your degree to the type of career that you're building for yourself. Um, as long as you're able to market that in a way that shows that you are qualified, you are competent, you are capable of being qualified for those jobs and for those opportunities. Um, a JD should be sufficient, but I'm with Victoria, unless somebody's going to pay for that MBA or another master's degree. Um, law school does cost a lot of money, so definitely keep that in mind. Absolutely. Robin, there's a question addressed to you having um, served as a law clerk. Uh, did you know about those opportunities in law school? How did you get that opportunity? How do you get that opportunity if you don't know people? I've always been um, really heavy on networking and I actually found out about the clerkship. Um, so I didn't do it, I didn't the, so I was an intern first for the same judge um, the summer between my 2L and 3L year. And then she hired me after, after that. Um, so one, when you get an internship, do a really good job, <laughs> um, but also network with people. I found out about the opportunity the summer of my one L year when another classmate interned with the same judge. Um, so not only networking with your peers in law school, um, but continue broadening your network of attorneys, um, judges. People are really eager to help you, especially when you're in law school. Um, go to the functions where the the uh, law firms are coming and they're inviting students for lunch, um, even going on interviews 
you'll be surprised at how some firms will come circle back. Maybe you go on an interview your 1L year, maybe they don't hire you um, for that summer internship, but they may call you up later on for an internship in the fall or the spring. And so just look for opportunities to connect with other attorneys um, and your classmates as well. Thanks. Um, did anyone else serve as a clerk? I didn't see, but okay. Um, yeah, oh, I. Oh, you did. Okay. I yeah, I served as a clerk, and and piggybacking off of what Robin said, I got my clerkship from networking. Um, I was at a um a reception for lawyers, judges of color, and um someone introduced me to a judge, and the judge was like, "Oh, what are you doing now?" Blah blah blah. And I was like, oh, I'm interested in litigation, whatever, whatever. And my friend was like, oh, no, Victoria needs a job. And, and so, you know, I sent my resume and that that was that. So um, absolutely, um, I think this is a good time to plug in, um, go to receptions, mixers, anything for a law students. Um, absolutely go. If, especially as a first generation lawyer, you're, you need to build a network that your parents were not able to give you. Um, and going to these bar associations, um, receptions and things like that is going to do that for you. Yeah, absolutely. 100% agree. We have so many questions coming in. So I'm just going to keep going with those because <laughs> I want to make sure we get to all of them. So uh, this next question from an anonymous attendee says, I have an MBA and JD sworn in New York 2022, working as a business consultant since 2019. I never worked in a legal setting except for the 250 plus hours at law school's legal clinic in 2018. I'm trying to break into the law practice and not getting any interest based on my lack of experience. Do you have any suggestions on how to handle that? whoever wants to answer. I would say, so it sounds like you have some experience with the clinics. Um, early on in law school, that's where I got my experience. And I worked with my clinical professor to start some of the community initiatives. And that's where I first got um, opportunities to draft wills and healthcare powers of attorney and other things. So partnering with other organizations like Legal Aid, they're always looking for um, people who can help. And there are always student opportunities to get that, um, the experience. Also, um, my entering into my 2L year, I called probably 75 law firms asking if I could just volunteer. And I, it didn't all happen at one time, but I, a lot of attorneys called me back and said, yes. Um, so I think you have to just be hungry and think outside the box to get those opportunities. Um, and don't be afraid to just put in that work on the front end because it, it will yield dividends later on. Um, as I graduated from law school, even some of the attorneys that I worked with, even if it was just for a week and you went and you filed papers, you will learn something at someone's law office because you're going to hear about a telephone call that they have with a client. They may um, have to run to the courthouse and show you how to file documents. So um, one, don't be afraid to do the free work because likely that's where you'll get the most experience, um, but also see how you can chart your own path in, in um find opportunities in areas of your interest. Um, and again, continue to network with people, not only just your classmates, but also people in the community. Yeah, I'll add on to that. I, I was going to say definitely networking, um, getting out, you know, whatever your local state, as well as the ABA bar associations, and, you know, take on some leadership opportunities, volunteer opportunities. Um, because just the more your name is out there, the more you connect with people, the more people start to think of you when these opportunities arise. Um, I remember when I first graduated, there were not a ton of opportunities, but you know, the more I got involved with things, the more you know I started to meet people, people started to come to you after a little bit. So yeah. Yeah. And definitely talk about the skills that you do in your consulting and how they transfer to whatever it is you're looking to do and learning, like Dylan was mentioning, how to market what you already have. Another question that came from the audience is, have you all found it important to share who you are? For example, 
your personal brand authentically with others to network, gain clients, build your practice? Or do you struggle with that finding that if you're working in spaces, or do you struggle with that working in spaces where there's other, uh, where there's not many other first gen lawyers or lawyers of color? That's a great question. Um, and I answer that because I faced hesitation for showing who I am really from all sides, right? Um, so I, I mean, obviously I'm a black person. I went to um, predominantly white institutions for undergrad and law school. And um, most of the places I work, I am the only black lawyer um, or sometimes the only black person. Um, and so, so from like my family's perspective, um, being the only lawyer in the family, they were very, you have to straighten your hair, you need to dress a certain way, um, you need to speak a certain way. You know, I, I talk very casually um, and they were like, oh, you can't do that. You can't be a lawyer and talk like that. And, and I understand the hesitation. So one, I never worked in big law. So if you're a first year in big law or you're going to big law, ignore this because this isn't going to work there. Um, I'm in government. So um, I really had to, uh, one, I'm, I'm the youngest child and I'm very outgoing. So I was kind of already naturally com more comfortable being who I am. Um, but it is a, a challenge sometimes. Um, locking my hair, getting a nose ring, wearing my nails how I want it to. Um, and so I would say if you're going to do that, like ease into it. Um, I didn't bring 100% of myself like at the beginning because I thought that would be a lot. When I went to law school, I had to change my accent because I was very country and people couldn't understand me and I had to just compromise on that. Um, but don't be scared to be who you are, but kind of you know, my dad said people need me in small doses. And so I try to do the small dose thing um, so that I can feel like I'm being authentic um, with not without like doing too much all at once. Um, but if you are in an area, if you're doing the type of law um, in a geographic area or with the type of clients or colleagues, um, that allow you to be your full self. Like one time I interned at Time in the general counsel's office and the people who were working in the Essence office, purple hair, red lipstick, just loud and proud and I loved it. Um, if you're working in an office like that, be your full self, but just kind of, um, if you're not just do it in baby steps um, in a way that feels kind of um, authentic to you. Any other comments? So what's the question again? Like is when you're in spaces where there's maybe not another a lot of first gen attorneys or attorneys of color mm -hmm. or any marginalized, you, you know, do you show your authentic self and how do you do that? You know, do you feel safe doing that? Is it a good idea to do that? I got you. Um, yeah. So at first, I, I I'll be honest, I definitely did not. Um, but that, that 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 can wear on you, you know, almost being two sided. What, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, the code switching, so to speak, or or if you're going through something on a personal level and you can't talk to a coworker or a boss about it because, frankly, they just won't know what you're going through because we're just not the same. But gradually, as I got more comfortable with my surroundings, more um, senior in my career. Yeah, you know, I, I let it be known, you know, like I'm a black man. I deal with these issues on a daily, you know, and I, I think Victoria kind of hit on it. So maybe not come out first day on a job and just say all that, but it is important. Um, so you got to like find, either find a job or firm or whatever it may be that, that you know, encourages that or kind of little by little, show your true authentic self show, you know like show who you are because it's important and I, i'll just say i used to feel drained right like because like law can be stressful anyway but then you're already you have to put up these fronts and these facades it's draining so yeah 
I'm going to chime in. I can't speak on the um, experience as a person of color, as I am not a person of color, but I will say as someone who is openly gay and LGBTQ+, plus, um, I went to school in the South. I went into law school in South Carolina. Um, I was, I learned very quickly in my classes when I was one of maybe three or four openly LGBTQ plus people in my entire institution um, that, you know, my peers were looking at me funny when I was talking with my hands and answering questions in class. Um, I was very nervous. I was uncomfortable being gay in the South. Um, I wouldn't hold my partner's hand. I wouldn't, you know, show affection to him in public, but I will say your personal brand is whatever you want it to be. Um, and to a certain degree, as a lawyer, as an attorney, you get to pick your clients. Um, you get to make a decision, depending on the practice of law that you're in, um, what kind of clients you want. And I think, as everyone has said, as you're opening those opportunities and doors for you to become authentic and be your fully authentic self, it'll attract the people that you want to be surrounded by, um, whether it's fellow law students, whether it's faculty and administration or it's people in the actual legal profession. So if that, if being truly authentic to yourself matters to your brand, do it and do it in a way that's safe and comfortable for you to do. Can I say something real quick? Yeah. Um, one, I completely agree with Dylan's last point that being your true authentic self will attract other like-minded people. Um, Cause what I was gonna say also in addition to that to the extent that you can, try to find a mentor in the legal profession. It doesn't necessarily have to be your practice area, but in the legal profession that, are, that is similar to you that you can relate to. And I say that to say, I, I met older you know, black gentlemen who are attorneys. While he was a, a medical malpractice attorney, I don't do med mal, but the fact that you're a black man who has made it through 20, 30, 40 years in the legal profession, made partner at his firm, I'm sure he's, you know, seen and experienced some of the same things. So be your true authentic self and those true people will attract to you and vice versa. And then you can, yeah, kind of grow and flourish from there. So, yeah. I'd also like to add um, just two things. One, sometimes when you bring your true authentic self, even from the beginning, you will be able to open up opportunities for yourself because in some industries, they're looking for that African-American um, woman so that she can provide her voice and a perspective that they don't already have at the table. So sometimes when you don't bring your authentic self to the table, um, even in the beginning, then you might be missing out not only on an opportunity to advocate for other people who are just like you, but also um, bringing a diverse perspective to the table that would never be heard if you choose not to speak up and be you. Um, second, also find some, um, just like Jonathan mentioned, not only mentors who have been in the game for decades, but find some colleagues who are your same age and similarly situated. When I moved to Charlotte, um, I was welcomed by a group of five other African, African American women. One um, was counsel for a professional um, ball team here. One was corporate counsel at another um, very large firm. Another was, so I won't, I won't list all of them, but we all practice different types of law, but we supported one another in everything we did in the legal profession, even to the extent of how do I show up when I do this deposition when, um, and no offense, but this white male has already given me a really hard time um, and I don't know how to respond. I am angry, but I'm also a professional. So what do I do? Um, and so finding a network of people who are similarly situated in terms of their career, who can hold your hand and walk with you as you progress to the, to the next level. I think that's really important. Thank you. So another audience question says, fellow first gen and recent bar passer here, I'm waiting to hear back from a position I'm passionate about, but the hiring process is taking a while. What can I do in the meantime to get work without taking on a full-time position, but still get a paycheck? Do you, oh, no, go, go ahead, Robin. Um, so I know a lot of people who took um, short-term document review projects, but then there are also 
attorneys like me <laughs> who are looking for um, people, maybe for maybe you have a litigation case or some other case that you just need a little bit of help um, outside of your normal staff, what your normal staff can provide. And um, so those are also opportunities you can sometimes find them through headhunters, but then also asking your um, your law school staff. I don't know if you have like a career services um, department at your school, but they sometimes also know of those short-term opportunities. Legal Aid also offers, a lot of the nonprofit organizations offer short-term um, opportunities. So consider that as well. I was just going to follow up with the docu document review opportunities as well. They're very short, um, sometimes week-long, month-long projects. Um, there's multiple companies out there as well. Uh, the legal document review business has boomed because of COVID. Um, so there's definitely opportunities if your concern is just getting something temporary to make a paycheck. Um, definitely look into some of those. If you want, I can share my information afterwards. I know quite a few that. I tried to work for while I was um, a recent graduate trying to find my career that I'm at today. So I'm definitely willing to help as well. Thank you. So another question we have is how did um, becoming a lawyer as a first gen lawyer impact your relationship with your family? So did you become like the de facto lawyer of the family? Did they resent you? Were they super supportive? Like how, what sort of impact did it have? Yeah, I'll start. Um, definitely no resentment. Um, definitely became the family lawyer um, asking me all types of things. And I'm like, bro, what? <laughs> like, I do real estate. You need to talk to someone else, man. <laughs> like, um, and, and then I'll just say to get ready for your family just not understanding your, your schedule and time commitment. So, you know, I'm in, I'm in private practice quote unquote big law and you know we have to you know track our time so on and so forth and sometimes I may get a call from my mom like hey you know I just thought we could do lunch and I'm like mom I love you but like I gotta get through this I will call you later you know what I mean like it, it just doesn't work like that um but definitely um a proud sense um and definitely became the family attorney and I just politely say Thank you, but I'm not in that area. Um, but I'm can glad you put you in touch with somebody or something like that. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, for me, it's been um, it's been good and bad. So one, like I'm the youngest. I've always been like very assertive. Um, and then having this legal background in my toolbox has made me even more um, I don't know, <laughs> just um, uh, we just get into it a lot sometimes, um, about a lot of things. Um, I'm, you know, I work in, in government and my last job was kind of politically related. So if you're talking anything about law, anything about politics, like I just always have a response and people just don't always want to hear it. Um, so you just have to navigate that in your personal relationships. Um, that's certainly something I've had to do. Um, it's been good in that I've been able to tell my family, like, look, I know that sounds like a good idea, but that is illegal. Um, and you should not do that because while this person can get away with that, you see on TV, they are a millionaire or a billionaire. And we're just not all operating on the same playing field. And so what you see this person do, you cannot do. So don't do it. Um, but it's, and it's also helped me to be able to say like, oh, you're being taken advantage of or someone's doing this to you like that's illegal like you can't someone can't just evict you or things like that where you know normally people say like, oh, they have no power and I can, you know, let my family my friends know like you have power in this situation, and you should not let them take advantage of you because they're a company or landlord or whatever. Um, you have rights and here's what they are and here's how you can go about asserting them. Um, so that's been really good as well. Um, I think it's also kind of a challenge uh, personally when you kind of make money um, and you make money more quickly than other people in your family. Um, I think that can um, 
especially not um, me personally, but for example, immigrant families, when you're making so much money and then you might have people who automatically want to rely on you. Um, so just be prepared for that. Um, and then also people who come out the woodwork, like, oh, so-and-so's an attorney. Can you help me? I have this child support issue. Like, no, I can't. One, I don't know you. Well, we might be cousins, but I don't know you, girl. Um, and I don't, I like uh, Jonathan was mentioning, I don't do family law. I can't, I can't help you with your baby daddy. I'm sorry. Best of luck to you. I can give you the number to the legal aid in your, in your state that I've never been to, but that's all I got for you. I'll see you at the family union. That's all. Legal aid can't help them either. I'm just saying, I'm just saying <laughs> very specific grants, <laughs> no. but no, it's funny to hear these stories because it's so true. It's like, you know, I have a question about whatever. And you're like, no, oh, I do too. I don't know anything about that, you know? So Dylan, Robin, have any remarks on that? I was just going to say, oh, Robin, do you have anything? Oh, I was just going to say when I was in school, like I'm a first semester law student, like Victoria said, everybody comes out of the woodwork. They think you've been an attorney practicing for 50 plus years and you're an expert in the law and you're not. Um, I had to learn how to preface every conversation that I had as a law student with my family members by just saying, okay, I am not an attorney. I'm not providing you legal advice. I cannot be providing you legal advice, but this is just what I learned in class. Um, but yeah, everybody, everybody comes out of the woodwork and thinks you are an expert. So learn how to navigate that and not violate any uh, ethic rules. So I'll echo what everyone else said. Um, funny story about what Victoria mentioned. I was in court and a cousin actually showed up for a child support matter um, and they were going to take him to jail. And I actually advocated <laughs> for him on that day on the spot um, and got his matter continued. So there is some power in just continuing a case so that they can go find their own attorney. <laughs> um, but yes, people will come out of the woodworks and ask you questions about matters of law that you have no idea. Everyone thinks like once you're an attorney, you, you're like a walking legal book. Um, that is not the case. As soon as you pass the bar, <laughs> it all kind of goes out of the other ear. Um, especially once you start to hone in on your practice area and you become um, more skilled in that area, you won't know about other areas of law and it might be dangerous for you to give advice about something that you don't know about. Um, so I often just, I refer out. And if I can ask a friend for a favor, which I rarely do, because I think we've all, all gone to law school for three years, we, we passed the bar, um, you put in your time, your, your time is money. Um, but I refer out, if I don't know, if I can't answer your question in five minutes, um, and even sometimes I don't have the time to do that. Um, I'm probably just going to refer you to someone else. Absolutely. Well, you guys, this has been wonderful. There um, are so many people in the comments just thanking you guys for being authentic, sharing your experiences. And um, this has really been an enjoyable and important conversation. As we close out, if you could just give like one word or one sentence to people who will um, become first-gen lawyers or are currently first-gen lawyers, what would that be? Dylan, we'll start with you. Oh gosh, um, I will definitely say give back. Um, take all of the experiences that you learned throughout law school and starting out into your career, whether it's law school, bar prep, um, getting into your career, give back. Help everybody out, help all of the people who are similarly situated like you um, or people who are not and just give back so we can all be a better legal profession. Absolutely. Victoria? So I would say the biggest mistake that I made um, in like my early law school times in college um, is not reaching out and asking for help, especially when it was offered. So I'm telling you all now, like if you're watching this, um, pick at least one person from this panel and get their contact information from the chat and reach out to them and stay in contact. Um, and whenever an, a practicing attorney or anyone offers to stay in contact with you, gives you their card, um, offers their help, 
reach out to them, connect, do not be scared or intimidated. Um, people want to help you and you need the help, whether you know it or not. So let people help you. That is exactly what we're here for. That's exactly why we're here today. Thank you. Jonathan? Yeah, um, I don't know if I can say just one thing, but I will try to keep it brief. Um, first, I always tell you know people, you know, young lawyers, law students come behind me, run your race, right? Do not compare yourself to your classmates or your or whoever, you know, because we're, we're all different. We all come from different backgrounds, different paths, different talents, different skills. So truly just run your race and just focus on being the best version of you every single day. And just good things will, it like things will tend just to work out. Um, two, similar to what Victoria said, uh, take care of yourself, reach out for help. And I mean that in like all aspects, right? That could be physical health, mental health, because there are just times when you're going to be looking around thinking like, man, am I cut out for this? I don't know. Maybe, you know, so really like we've all been there before. So yeah, like reach out, take care of yourself mentally, physically, emotionally. Um, there are resources you can take advantage of um, because yeah, we've all been there before and you just have those thoughts that come in your mind. So yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Robin? Just know that you will be successful. And when you are, pull someone else along. 100% agree. That is great. Again, thank you to our panelists and our attendees. I hope you have found this just as enjoyable as me. Thank you to our ABA YLD leadership for supporting this program. And you all have a wonderful afternoon. Bye. Thank you, everyone. See y'all.